Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by MailChimp. Manage lists with 2,000 subscribers and send up to 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. And by New Relic. Visit newrelic.com slash twist and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by Amazon Web Services. Get the resources you need to easily get started with AWS Activate, a new global program for startups, including AWS credits, training, developer support, a startup community forum, and special offers from third parties. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Today on This Week in Startups, the founder, yes, the founder of the real true founder of the Wikipedia, Larry Sanger is with me to talk about the founding of Wikipedia, what he thinks of citizen journalism, crowdsourcing of uh, content creation, liberty, freedom, justice, the press, and of course his new uh, startup, which will be coming out this fall called InfoBit. It's a new startup. This is gonna be an amazing, amazing uh, show. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey everybody, hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. It's the casual Mark Zuckerberg edition. Yes, Jason is wearing, for those of you watching, my James uh, purse, uh, is that guy kind of pronounce purse? My like little hoodie. And people are like, wow, Jason, you always wear like a nice blazer and a shirt and you look professional and today you look very grungy. That's because I just got back from San Francisco. The launch hackathon was a huge, huge success. The largest hackathon I ever held. Over a thousand participants, over 200, no, Maybe 350 teams, but then at the end there were about 150. What an amazing event the Launch Hackathon was. Thank you for everybody who uh, participated and supported at the sponsors, Capital One and Amazon and Dine and Dropbox. I'm just dropping names now. Facebook, Google, so many great supporters. But I was so impressed with the products that came out of it. So thanks to all the hackers who participated. And we didn't have any nonsense. It was a very serious uh, affair. And uh, the five winners were fantastic. The Launch Fund is going to invest in uh, five companies, $100,000 over those five companies. And then uh, we're going to syndicate the best ones to AngelList if uh, they can get you know, their package together and make it AngelList worthy. We had two great um, – really two great fireside chats, Kevin Rose and uh, Naval – uh, Ravikant from AngelList, so they, they sort of bookmarked the event. We learned a lot. The judging process was insane. You know, we had 12 tables of judges with two judges at each. They had to get through 12 projects. It was imperfect. We made mistakes. We probably missed some of the best ones. In fact, I'm sure we missed three or four of the best ones, but we'll make it up to them because we'll have them at the Launch Festival at the end of February. You can find out all information about our uh, events at launch.co. And one of the great things about the launch series of events is that we always provide free tickets. That's right, free, F-R-E-E, -E, to aspiring entrepreneurs because the mission of launch and This Week in Startups and a lot of what I do and the team here does is to inspire and support entrepreneurs. That is our mission statement. We want to inspire and support entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, innovation, all those great things. And by listening to the show, you're participating in that. Um, the person on the program today, Larry Sanger, is a true innovator. Um, he actually is the guy who created the Wikipedia, in my estimation. Now, some people, this is a, Larry, there's a lot of debate over who actually created the Wikipedia. I suppose there is. There is a bit. Everybody knows Jimmy Wales claims to be the founder of the Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. uh, but take us back to the beginning of the Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. What was your role? What was Jimmy's role? How did, this, how did that all start for people who don't know? Well, uh, I was out of a job at the beginning of 2000, and I was thinking of pivoting a website that I had then to another one. And I um, emailed Jimmy Wales along with a lot of other people um, the idea for the site. And he said, oh, don't, don't work on that. Come and, and start this, uh, this free encyclopedia for me. Um, so I was hired to start the project. Originally, it was called Newpedia. And then we pivoted that after a year, and it became Wikipedia. So, so. how did that pivot occur? Because that's an interesting story in and of itself. Yes. It was Newpedia, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. was a for-profit venture. And Wikipedia was part of that for-profit venture as well, yes. Um, so basically what happened was about 
six months after we started working on it, it, it we decided that that it was not growing fast enough. We wanted more people to be able to participate. And uh, so I cast around for a lot of different ideas about how to improve Newpedia. We both were well agreed that it, it, something needed to be done right. to improve traction. And uh, over... Was this 2001? Uh, this was in 2000, actually. Oh, yeah. okay. So um, I guess it was the evening of July 2nd in 2001, I, I had uh, uh, Mexican food with a friend of mine down in Pacific Beach in uh, San Diego, and uh, he was telling me about these cool things called wikis that he was participating a lot in. And um, I had been thinking about, you know, okay, how do we solve Newpedia's problem? How can we get more people involved? And More people involved in creating a for-profit encyclopedia to compete against Encyclopedia Britannica, which yeah. wouldn't put their information online. You, you pretty much have it. That's yeah. right. Um, so... Um, Let's see. So I, I am immediately, within minutes of his mentioning this this idea, that it, it was fascinating to me. So I talked to him all throughout. His, his name is Ben Kovitz, and I talked to him throughout the meal uh, about, okay, so, well, how does it really work? And if anybody can edit, it doesn't mean it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, mess up. And, and Ben had a lot of the answers, and so I, I basically went home and wrote up a, a one-page uh, proposal um, and uh, arguing essentially, look, this is really easy to install, so uh, just install it for me, please, and I'll, I'll get it going. So, then, um, and then, you know, within a couple of days, I had a, an installed wiki to, to start working on. So, and that really, if that didn't occur, yeah, Jimmy was going to shut down, as at least he told me and other people, he was shutting down Newpedia, right? He, he was losing money on it. And he was kind of bummed out about it. Yeah, I, I mean, he, I don't know what he felt about it in his heart of hearts, absolutely. Uh -huh. But yeah, he was definitely disappointed in it. And uh, we, uh, as I say, we were both well agreed and something needed to be done. Um, and I think you're right, basically. If uh, Wikipedia or something like it didn't... Uh, uh, didn't appear, then, um, yeah, the whole project would have been shut down. So you, Larry Sanger, put the wiki mm -hmm. in the Pedia. Uh, I suppose you could say that, yes. Now, not to be controversial and not to um, wail on Jimmy Wells, <laughs> but hmm. Jimmy Wells erased your name multiple times as the person who co-founded Wikipedia, when you, in fact, because you mm -hmm. found out from Ben Kovitz about the Wikipedia, mm -hmm. you're the one who took a, a static content publishing system mm -hmm. and made it miraculously into what is one of the 10 largest sites in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, How does that feel as an individual to have the person you work for, and to make mm -hmm. the biggest innovation in the world, mm -hmm. literally one of the 10 biggest innovations in the world, and the guy who was there, who you helped do it, tried to re erase your name from history. What does that make a man feel like, Larry? <laughs> well, boy, the way you put it really makes it sound like I should be completely outraged, but uh, I guess I've sort of gotten over it. I really was pretty outraged when it, when it I, I came to the conclusion that, that he was deliberately misleading people. It took a couple of years before I decided that that was what was going on. But since then, I've kind of gotten over it. Yeah. You know? But do you get, like, the $50,000 speaking gigs or the $10,000 speaking gigs, and you get to hang out with Bono I've or fly private jets and stuff like that because you are truly the person who, on a product basis, built mm -hmm. this. You know, Jimmy may have been the CEO of it. I understand I'm the CEO, but I'm also the product guy. The truth is he brought you in as the product guy. You yeah. have a serious claim as the true founder. Yeah. So I, uh, what I claim is that... Uh, well, I don't need to claim it. It's on the press releases, yeah. the first three press releases that Jimmy Wales himself personally put out. Um, so he's actually contradicted himself on this point. Um, yeah. So Interesting. Um, 
I am outraged not by it. You know that. Because <laughs> okay. I've said it. I think Jimmy well. I said, let me tell you something. As a fellow entrepreneur mm-hmm. and as somebody who's tried to do innovative stuff in mm-hmm. my life over a 20-year career, you have only a couple of great innovative moments in your life when you look back on it. Mm-hmm. And to have what will undoubtedly be the number one or number two innovation of your life. I mean, even if InfoBit is incredible, I mean, there's really something like Wikipedia is a once in a, you know, a couple of hundred year invention. To have that, somebody try to take that away from you, I believe is so unfair. And that's when I lost all respect for Jimmy Wales. I'll be honest. When I saw him going into the Wikipedia himself, Mm -hmm. he literally went into the tool that you suggested, which allowed anybody to edit. This is to think about how sinister this really is. And then I'll move on. But to take the tool that you brought to him to save the company and to make the most beautiful creation in the information space for all of mankind, in the history of mankind, this might be the most beautiful creation ever made, you know, since the printing press. And and arguably, it's much more powerful. I mean, historically, we'll see. Um, A fact to be debated. But he used that same tool himself Mm -hmm. in a bizarre way to actually delete you from the Wikipedia's founding page. Yeah. Knowing he would get caught, <laughs> which makes it even more deranged to me. Yeah, that's I never understood that. It's very strange. Isn't it deranged? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't call it deranged, but I think I it's think very it's, odd. It's, I think it's deranged. To, I think it's bizarre because you know in your heart of hearts people will know that you made the edit. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like you're saying, I'm going to take you out of the history and take away your finest hour, mm-hmm. knowing that people will know I did it eventually. Yeah. Has he ever apologized to you? Have you ever seen him since then? Uh, no. And he never apologized to you? No. I, he he still maintains that he's the sole founder, as far as I know. What a... So. <laughs> oh, I want to say the D word so badly. I just... <laughs> whoo! He's such a douche. Um, I just thought that. I didn't actually say it. All right, listen. When we get back from commercial break, I want to hear... Um, about what you think of where Wikipedia has gone, mm-hmm. where it's succeeded and failed. It's a lot of different hot button issues over the last decade. Um, and then talk about your first for profit venture, InfoBit, uh, when we get back from this break. And let me tell you something this is an easy break for me to do. Um, something truly innovative, like the Wikipedia. New Relic, of course, app performance increases happiness. You can get immediate code level visibility and build faster, more reliable web and mobile applications with New Relic. I use it myself. We're using it at launch. We're going to use it at inside.com, which is coming at the end of the year, early next year. And uh, they've got 50,000 customers. That's right. Nike, Warby Parker, Airbnb, Comcast, AT&T, et cetera, et cetera. They're always innovating. And they just announced that they added Node.js to their languages that they support. Which means, like, you know, things like Twitter, Call of Duty, which are all real time apps, use Node.js. And what you can do is you can see on a very detailed level how your apps are doing. Here is uh, the launch ticker, and I can see 100% uptime and how long it's, um, how fast it is that the CPU u- your utilization is under 3%. The error rate is just, you know, minute. The throughput is great. The response time, the memory, the database, you know, you get to see everything, all layers of your application speed because speed is the best feature of any application. Marissa Mayer and uh, the folks at uh, Google and Yahoo, everybody's preaching that. In fact, a large part of Instagram's great success was being fast. Go to newrelic.com slash twist. And sign up and get a free This Week in Startups t-shirt. That's right. Go to newrelic.com slash twist and get a free This Week in Startups t-shirt. The New Relic team loves the This Week in Startups audience. They love entrepreneurs and they love founders and innovation as much as I do. And that's why they support this program. Go to newrelic.com slash twist. It's super fast, super easy, and no credit card is required. Thank at New Relic on your Twitter handle. Why do you think Wikipedia has become so successful? Because uh, it was the first to the market with a, a model that engaged a whole bunch of people in allowing them to uh, to submit um, content without any with very little friction. Basically, it's the the fact that it's so frictionless. You don't even have to create an account in order to to start uh, uh, an article or add to an article. So. Was this um, innovation, though, that anybody can contribute based on that book, The Professor and the Madman? Remember that book that was like... Yeah, uh, I, where I they... read it after starting Wikipedia. So. Ah, so it was after. Yeah, but I read it. It was a great book. 
um, t- tell the audience who hasn't read The Professor and the Madman just the basic sort of idea of what it is. Like, Well, um, so there was, uh, it's about the creation of the Oxford, um, at the Oxford English Dictionary, and uh, of course, before computers in the 19th century. And one of the uh, most prolific of the contributors uh, was this guy who happened to be in an insane asylum. He was very smart and he was able to do the work very well, but he was he was also crazy. Um, and it's basically the story of how the whole system worked. And from the point of view of someone who organizes people to create content, it was just absolutely fascinating to me. Yeah, it's an amazing read. If you uh, get a chance, yes. pick it up um, or uh, listen to the audio book. I have the audio book from uh, Audible. But a crazy person sent in all the definitions in the Oxford English Dictionary, and they, he was the largest contributor. So this idea that anybody can contribute, even if they're mm-hmm. crazy, is a good one. The openness. No, I, I, I still believe that. But openness does have a problem. Yes. And one of the biggest problems, I think, is um, bios of living people. Yes. That's one of the problems, yeah. Why is that such a hot-button issue for the Wikipedia? So let me preface this by saying that I've sort of promised the Wikipedia community that I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to slag them so much as I have in the past. <laughs> so, um, oh, I mean, what, but, but what is I can the issue I can yet? talk about it generally. Yeah, sure. generally, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the the issue is that uh, you've got a lot of people, many of whom are completely anonymous, writing uh, stuff that is really consequential to the reputations of many people. Often, um, people who uh, they aren't they're they're reasonably prominent in their fields, but they're not famous. You know, uh, um, they're not public figures, right. so to speak. And when those people are up for a job or other important decisions, other people will look at their Wikipedia articles and see, in some cases, some things that are extremely unflattering. So, on the one hand, you want to keep the whole process, the editorial process, independent, right. you know, uh, because that's necessary for objectivity and f- for uh, equality, right? But on the other hand, there has to be a more effective way for people to, to uh, uh, register corrections mm. and to actually get them uh, to be listened to by the community because there is no organizer, uh, there is no editor-in-chief anymore. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes you're dealing with a sort of uh, a faceless blob if you end up um, the, the target of, of somebody with uh, so often an, an anonymous person with a vendetta. I, I had a friend, uh, Bernie Heisch, who um, is a, a distinguished physicist who had an article written about him. And because he also has written about UFOs, he uh, became a target of, of skeptics. And they, they really uh, said some, uh, well, not just unflattering, but inaccurate things about him. Right. He, he ended up writing a, a column for the, uh, the LA Times about it. And um, I think he was very badly treated. So. Yeah, and the difficult part is, I mean, you can get slandered, of course, right? And then if you have an army of people who are on your side, anonymous, sock puppets, you know, multiple IP address people, they'll win because they have an ax to grind. Because the good people in the world, mm. correct me if I'm wrong, are not going to be as motivated to come to your defense on the Wikipedia, at, at least not in the same volume or with the same energy as maybe the haters. Is that, is that what happens typically, do you think? It's not supposed to work that way, but I'm afraid it does. Yeah. Um, for, for very specialized articles that only a few people care about, right? You know, um, right. there could be uh, one or two haters, as you say, um, and then all the friends that they can call to their assistance. Yeah, the assistance. yeah. Yeah, uh, and then uh, there's the, the, the target, 
and whoever he can muster to. And what makes it particularly frustrating sometimes, because I've been the, the subject of this treatment too sometimes, um, is that you have to engage with the community on its own terms. There is no normal, sane way. You have to uh, write on the Wikip Wikipedia talk pages. You, uh, Which is very hard to do, by the way. Like Just the media wiki markup for a civilian to go in and try to have a conversation with a bunch of anonymous users and defend their position, right. it probably takes a month or two to understand how the Wikipedia works in terms of dynamics, or a couple of days at least, right? Yeah, well, it depends on the person, but yeah, yeah. it's there's definitely a learning curve. Um, and there is this issue, I find, in terms of not just is it true or not, because it does seem like it's getting better at figuring out what's true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a long time, people would just change my page to put that I dated Sharon Stone because I made a joke one time, like, I, I command all of the This Week in Tech audience to just keep putting that I dated Sharon Stone in my, you know, 20s. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, that would be like on the Wikipedia. In fact, if you're listening right now, you can go ahead and put that in there that I dated Sharon Stone in my 20s. So it was very notable. Mm -hmm. um, just to see how long, you know, what percentage of time would be up there. But then what's gotten really interesting is when you start having a long career, mm -hmm. what percentage mm -hmm. of your page is dedicated to your worst moments your best moments, mm -hmm. and the ones that don't matter. Right. And I have this never-ending thing where, like, the three or four times I've gotten in fights with people or a lawsuit or this or that, that becomes the majority of my page, and the people seem to obsess over those things. And then it's like, hey, well, you've invested in 50 companies. You've started a bunch of companies. You've done all this stuff. That doesn't get any play. Right. How do you deal with that issue? Because that's a subtle issue. That's not just a toggle of on or off. Yes. What would you call that issue? Um, and how does that get resolved? Undue weight, I think, is yeah. the term that they use. Ah. Yes. And there's there's rules against that. They're not supposed to do that, I think. Um, yes. I think it, it really depends on who is at the other end of the controversy, yeah. you know, as far as I can tell. When did the Wikipedia decide to be a nonprofit and why? Because... Yeah. You do mm -hmm. constantly hear this refrain mm -hmm. of, hey, if this was a for-profit venture, it would be worth... Mm -hmm. Billions. Tens of billions. Yes. Yeah. So h how did it wind up being a nonprofit, and could it exist as a for-profit? Do you think would it be better as a for-profit? Okay. Two completely different sure. questions. Take whichever one you like. Um, so originally, uh, we were going to be... a a, a for-profit, and um, I always worried from the very beginning about um, people who, because there hadn't been that many of these public participatory sites, mm -hmm. you know, there was DMOZ before, and, uh, and, and some others, like Everything Too, if you remember that. Yeah, Everything Too, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, there weren't that many sites the way that there are now that are monetized with ads, and I was worried uh, about what would happen. And I was right to worry, and I think we probably should have been more f uh, forthright about that and stay stating repeatedly that, you know, we're, we are going to start running ads eventually. Because what happened was um, a couple of months before we intended to start running ads, we made a general announcement. This was toward the end of 2001 um, that we were going to start running ads. And the, the, uh, the Spanish Wikipedia was up in arms about this. And uh, as a result, they, they uh, started their own competing Spanish language Wikipedia or wiki. Um, and they seceded. They seceded, essentially. Well, some of them did. Right. Um, and I think that was that was sort of like the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, uh, I think actually even before that happened, uh, I was I was told Are you, we're not going to be able to pay pay you um, because the the bottom had fallen out of the the tech market. Sure, okay. dot com bust. Yes, the the the, the bubble burst, and um, so. I, when I, uh, you know, the last time that I worked that I was paid, which I think was, was it March 1st, I think, uh, 2002, 
Um, basically, very shortly thereafter, Jimmy Wales says, okay, uh, so we don't have to pay Larry anymore. So Wikipedia has almost no expenses. So we're just, uh, we're not going to be running ads. And uh, even before then, uh, we, we had already been talking about making it into a, a nonprofit, um, even an ad-supported nonprofit. But then it just obviously their main business model was out the window. And so the, the, the fallback position that we had all, always talked about um, became reality. They didn't actually start the, the uh, um, nonprofit for another 18 months or something like that after and that. That would be known as the biggest mistake in entrepreneurial history, <laughs> I think. That or not selling Pointcast for $500 million. Jimmy Wales right now, mm -hmm. if he had just made it a Wikipedia and said, it's going to be Wikipedia just like YouTube is an open platform. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an open platform, but I own it, and it's going to have ad revenue at some point. You can turn the ads off with a membership, whatever. Mm -hmm. He would have made – he could have raised an unlimited amount of venture capital. He would have gone public. Yeah. I estimate Jimmy Wales' personal worth right now would be greater than Larry Page's because he would have owned – 50% of it at the IPO, 40% of the IPO didn't need a lot of money to run. Well, he had two partners, um, and I, I don't know what, what percentage, percentage they, they yeah. owned. The, I, I don't think he was actually the main partner, but I don't know, actually. Right. Um, they would have made tens of billions. Yeah, they would have made a lot. They would all be billionaires. That is a pretty mm -hmm. interesting dynamic with Jimmy Wales' personality. My... Yeah. You know, dime store psychologist, as everybody knows, I was a psychology major in college, so that gives me the ability to analyze anybody. <laughs> I think Jimmy Wells is scarred for life mm -hmm. because he lost the opportunity to become that wealthy and powerful. And I think that he displaces, displaced that anger on you for sharing the co-founder thing, and he should have been a mensch and made you the, and, and recognize you as the true co-founder and given you your yeah. credit. But I think that's what drives that guy, and that's why he's a, you know, kind of got like a, a little bit of a weird thing. I'm not a psychologist, and I, although I, I had plenty of, of dealings with him, I don't, he's, he's a hard guy to read. Hard guy to read. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Okay, when we get back from commercial break, it's time to talk about Larry Sanger's new project when we get back. Uh, and listen, another easy, easy peasy ad read for me. MailChimp is a product I have been using. <laughs> MailChimp, the product. I, Jason Calacanis, have been using for mm, getting close to a decade. Everybody loves MailChimp. It's absolutely fantastic. The features are amazing. The pricing is amazing. If you don't own the relationship, a direct relationship with your 1,000 true fans, your 10,000 true fans, your 100 true fans, you are blowing it. You have no idea how to run a company or to build your career. Twitter followers are great. Facebook likes, mm, kind of a ripoff. YouTube subscribers, 50-50, eh, okay, somewhere between those two things. But emails, emails are worth $5, $10, $20 each, depending on what vertical you're in. And if you can develop an email relationship with somebody, I can tell you there are people who I've had their e same email address with for 20 years going on now. And I email them, I get an email back, and I have that direct relationship where they double opted into my MailChimp list. And what that does is whenever I have something new going on, like the hackathon or, God, I had a great guest like Larry on the show, I email those people. That's why... Over this slow burn of two decades of a career, collecting those email addresses has paid off so well for me. The way I do it, simply, easily, powerfully, and affordably is with MailChimp. I hate to give, like, it's such a great commercial when I read it because it's not a commercial. It's an endorsement. If we were sitting here at a bar and you said, what should I use? I would outline all these facts because I use it. And I know all the people who I send to MailChimp love the product. 2,000 subscribers and 12,000 sent emails per month are free. These guys know what they're doing over there. It's an incredible team. Uh, I've met a bunch of the people, and they're constantly releasing new and awesome features like the brand new MailChimp, which is optimized for tablets. It's got a cleaner design and less clutter. Look how beautiful it is. And you get these great templates. It's gorgeous. Sign up for free. Sign up for free. And uh, the free plan is always free. Uh, it's also good for team collaboration. You can give like different people on your team different rights to do stuff. But it's so easy. It's so fast. Anybody can do it. It's a software as a service at its best. Thank you at MailChimp. And everybody go ahead and thank at MailChimp on your Twitter account. Um, I really do appreciate all the support uh, from my friends over there. Thanks, Ben, and everybody else. Okay. You've had this great career. You've studied uh, you know, so much about um, content, where it's going. And now you want to go from reference material, like the Wikipedia, right? Mm -hmm. You want to go into news. These are two very different things, correct? 
Well, they're both information. I, I think they're both uh, knowledge categories. Okay. So I call myself a uh, an online knowledge organizer. So. Okay. So InfoBit News, front page news, ranked and summarized by you and me. We're a community that scours the web. I'm reading from your website right now, InfoBit, if people want to go check it out. Right. Um, and ranks and reports and competes to see who can write the best summaries. Result, a readable, useful crowdsourced newspaper. Finally, a way to crowdsource high-quality content and a way for you and me to build a new site that's actually useful. So um, sounds like you took Wikipedia and read it or dig, put them in a blender, and you got something new brewing. Tell me about it. What's the inspiration here? I really can't talk very much about it. I'm right. sorry. It's <laughs> uh, my, my PR person... Um, she uh, she thinks we have an excellent chance at at uh, publicity when we launch. Right. And if I if I uh, well, let let's... much more out of the bag. Okay, well I'm I'm reading the page and everybody's seen the page. People have been buzzing about the you know the landing page. Yeah. So let's just talk about what what you think of news. Then we'll step back okay. and not ruin the launch. That's fine. Yeah. So yeah. what is wrong with news today? What are the problems in news that lead somebody with your pedigree to say I have to get off the bench and just try to solve this problem what are the problems well the online communities are incredibly powerful right i just look at all the different verticals that they have been uh, that have they've been applied to uh, youtube does videos facebook does relationships pinterest does interest it goes Shopping, on something yeah no one has done that for front page news right Right. Well, I mean, people might argue Reddit. Mm -hmm. So let's de let's delve into the Reddit sort of right. for a second. Yeah. Is that not for a lot of people the front page of the internet, as they call themselves? Like, is that not for some category of people how they get their news? They rank it, they vote it, they they yeah. write it up themselves, they curate it. Yeah. So I don't want to take anything away from Reddit. I sure. mean, they've got well, their place. But what do they do right? Yeah. But um, yeah. they they do plenty right. I mean, that's why they've got they've got uh, the the community, the enormous community that they do. Um, but uh, they they don't specialize in newspaper news, th mm. serious that's news, true. Yeah. right? I mean, they've got a news category, but that's it's kind of focused on, like, news of the weird and cool news and and uh, things that you hadn't heard that didn't get enough play, and that kind of thing. Right. Right? So Memes, yes. videos. Right. And that's outside of the news category, and yeah. that's, that's where they really excel. Right. You know, that's not really hasn't been the the purpose of crowdsourcing as most people have have uh, conceived of it and I, ever since i started working on newpedia and then wikipedia i've been aware of the power of organizing um the world's smartest people and best writers not just not just everybody but in particular the uh the people who make it their business to to know things and to um, explain them very carefully. What if you could, and there, there's millions of those people right. in the world, right? right? But they're not organized and they're not working together um, on, on much of anything except, uh, no one has disrupted that community, let's put right. it that way, right? And, and it isn't just that. I think that Ordinary, reasonably bright people can be organized in, in ways uh, to create all kinds of amazing new things. But the focus has to be on high quality. It has to be on reliability and coming up with ways of, of highlighting uh, and presenting, ultimately, uh, the best content. And the, the reason why we don't get this from sites like Reddit is that you basically you have to take the bad with the good in order to, for the community to remain a completely open community. Right. And that openness, as we saw with Wikipedia, is exactly what makes the the community thrive. It, it it will not work if it's not completely open and if it doesn't give everybody a chance to be on the front page and that kind right. of thing. So it's a hard problem. It's a hard nut yeah. to crack. But. Uh, I you think, think I, you can. Yeah. I think. I think. I. I Let's we talk will. about citizen journalism and the blurring line between the audience mm -hmm. and the journalists. 
mm-hmm. because as we saw with you know whatever the most recent tragedy was like the Boston bombing let's say so much of the news gathering mm-hmm. was done by people on the scene who were not journalists mm-hmm. photos videos and a tipping point i feel like happened during that instance which was people did their own speculation mm-hmm. and sort of analysis of the situation mm-hmm. sometimes it was very far off and sometimes it was you know mm-hmm. like cia cia police fbi level accurate where yeah. they started to figure out who these people were and what was motivating them yeah. what do you think the role of sort of citizen journalism is right now in journalism well, I think it's basically amplifies what's already available out there. It puts the news into a, a, a context that uh, it allows people to interact with the news. Um, there aren't very many regular folks, non-journalists, who break important stories. Of course, there are, right? You know, um, but not that many. And uh, so on the one hand, it looks like the main role of the crowd in, in um, news is to comment on it, to react to it, right. and that kind of thing. I don't think it has to be that way. I think that, that they can actually uh, participate in, in, the, uh, in the curating of news and that kind of thing. And that's something that isn't being really effectively crowdsourced right now. And you're seeing, actually, a lot of these newspapers are downsizing to a tremendous level. Mm -hmm. And the people who are growing are the people like Huffington Post, Mm -hmm. Business Insider, Gawker, BuzzFeed, a lot of which are doing a combination of original reporting, but mainly reblogging, regurgitation, curation. Commenting. Commentary on top of it. Are we getting dangerously close to a point where there aren't enough original reporters out there doing the hard work and too many people just piggyback on it on it well everybody wants to comment on it and there's definitely a need for uh, original reporting on that has access to to sources i mean that's that's one thing uh, that that people who sing the praises of citizen journalism don't sometimes realize um and that is that there is a, an ongoing need. I don't think the need is going to go away for people who are specially trained um, to write up stories very quickly and accurately. If, if you've ever been the subject of a news story or if you've ever tried to write a, a, a news story uh, from scratch, it's especially if you try to do it quickly, you realize just how difficult it is. Sure. It's extremely difficult. So there's that. Um, and the other thing is um, journalists are the only ones that the uh, newsmakers are going to sit down and talk with. It, only somebody like George Stephanopoulos is going to be able to get an interview with the president, right? Um, and there has to be a level of, of trust. So there, in, in a way, there is a, a sort of a PR function of professional journalists that the crowd is never going to be able to satisfy. And there's always going to be a demand for that. Um, although, I, again, I have to agree, um, especially in the local level, local news, there's a, a, a sad lack of reporting it feels like it's over for local news. I mean, AOL spent tens of millions of dollars trying to reinvent it. As these small papers died, they launched Patch. I don't know if you mm-hmm. followed that. Some people think it's a bit of a debacle, okay. but I do think that they had a pretty good idea, but maybe they went too wide, maybe did too many cities. But mm-hmm. do you, how do you think that gets solved? Do you think people just don't have coverage of their you know, town anymore, or that somebody will rise up and figure this out, or is it just going to be like there's one blogger or tweeter who someone just takes is going to rise up for, and yeah. they're going to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, it, because there's there's a need for it. There is the, the, there's a, a base level um, of demand. I don't think it's going to go away. Um, and 
Yeah. I'll tell you, though, I mean, it, it, it is a real problem. I'm just, I think of my own case. Um, I was spending, you know, eight or ten bucks a month on the Columbus Dispatch, my local yeah. newspaper, um, so I could uh, get to the app. But I was just reading it so little, and I was getting my news from other sources anyway. And it's like I, I wanted to keep giving them the money just out of this civic obligation, sense of civic obligation. And uh, I ended up canceling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in some senses, they were covering the wrong stuff. They're covering national issues to try to get page views. But really, maybe the model is to just let the local people pay the 10 bucks a month as a civic duty, 100 bucks a year, and just focus solely on what's happening locally, the local sports, the local businesses, the local government. Yeah. Local news, uh, one of the problems with local news is precisely that um, it, it isn't really so much about the news that's happening locally. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, newscasts and also newspapers to a certain extent are becoming more tabloidy. Mm. You know, so it's a problem that a lot of journalists complain about, and I understand them. So. Yeah, it seems like they have much less time to work on stories, and they're being driven to do the ones that drive page views, which are not the ones that are the most important. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like it's really exactly. crashing and burning, but I guess that's part of things being rebuilt is it has to come to a really brutal end sometimes in order for people to want to be motivated to fix the problem. I think it's going to be fixed. The, I, I have... I have a great deal of faith in, in the internet and in uh, the power of innovation. I mean, you've seen it sure. after your last uh, weekend. Yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing what people uh, can come up with. And uh, I'll end with crowdfunding. Here's uh -huh. something that didn't exist in the early days of Wikipedia. Here's right. something that, you know, is really becoming a force. Crowdfunding seems to be hitting journalism. I just saw that um, a journalist who wanted to cover the News Corp phone hacking scandal, mm -hmm. who couldn't get anybody to like sort of send him to the actual trial, raised four thousand pounds from the public to awesome. go and tweet the the sort of uh, proceedings. That. That's great. Yeah, pretty crazy. It and is then, really cool. What do you think the possibility is of? Uh, you know, a lot of these special assignments being crowdfunded, you think that that's a possible solution? It sounds pretty plausible to me. I think that I, I think there's going to be some room for, uh, you know, philanthropic support of that kind of thing, too. Yeah. All right. Listen, this has been an amazing discussion. Everybody go to Infobit, uh, I-N-F-O-B-I-T-T dot com. It's coming this fall. The fall's <laughs> ending. You're going to get this out. Yeah, I, you I may gotta, have to put winner on that I side. I need to update that, You may frankly. want to put winner. <laughs> it yes. always takes three months longer, right, to get it right? <laughs> but you can go there yes. and get an invite. Put your email in and make sure you, you monitor it. So let listen, what would it take for you and, like, Jimmy Wales to be on, like, cool terms? Should he just come out and admit, like, and give you your credit? What do you think? If he did that, would that mean a lot to you? Sure. Yeah, it would. Yeah. All right, so here's, here's what happens. Everybody who's a super fan of the show, I want you to just tweet right now. Dear at Jimmy Wells, please, <laughs> um, please be a good guy and give – what's your Twitter handle, Larry Sanger? You have a Twitter handle? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's L Sanger. Okay, so everybody go ahead and just say, Dear at Jimmy Wells, please give at L Sanger his credit as the co-founder of Wikipedia. Love whatever your name is. All right, listen, an amazing episode, Larry. You're one of my favorite people and thinkers in the space. Everybody far, follow Larry at L Sanger, S-A-N-G-E-R. Go to infobit.com and um, definitely, definitely uh, keep your eye out for it because yeah. I think it's going to be something yeah. special. Sign up for an invite. Sign up for an invite. Get that email in there and make sure you tweet it to all your friends. Thanks again to New Relic for making a great product and MailChimp for making a great product. I am such a lucky bastard. Let me tell you something. There's nothing better than having the support of products you really love uh, and, and friends, really. These guys are, and gals over there are all great friends of mine uh, and support the team here to support entrepreneurship. You can follow This Week in Startups at TWI Startups, TWI Startups. And if you want to uh, get the launch ticker, uh, go to at launch ticker. And you can follow Launch at Launch. And, of course, I am at Jason. Thanks again to Brandis and Gina, producer Gina, Kristen, Jade, Tamont, my wife Jade, the other Jade, um, Simon, Luke, 
uh, for the sales and Emily for making all the events work so properly. What a great team I have here. And we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. <laughs>